In this video, we'll be diving into gene linkage and the chi-square test. It's higher level content from D3.2 on inheritance. One of the words that you'll be hearing quite a bit in this video is this word locus. Um, locus is singular, loci is plural, and locus just means a specific location of a gene on a chromosome. Now remember that each gene codes for a polypeptide, and if I take a look at chromosome number seven here for humans, there are several well-known genes, and I actually know their exact locations. This is pretty cool. Um, I highly recommend using databases to find these. It's a very interesting, um, lab and makes for some great data analysis at another time. Because all of these genes are found on the same chromosome, they are considered to be linked genes, okay? Now, linked genes do not follow the law of independent assortment. They will be inherited together unless recombination occurs. So remember, recombination is a result of crossing over, and that happens in prophase one of meiosis. So unless crossing over occurs, and these alleles are reshuffled, then they will be inherited together. Whether or not this takes place is highly influenced by the distance between those genes. Genes that are very close together are likely to be inherited together because there's very little room here for crossing over to occur. Genes that are located far apart are less likely to be inherited together because it's, there are many opportunities here for crossing over to occur. We have a special notation for linked genes. So let's say I'm looking at two traits. If they are unlinked, then I would write them like this, like side by side from each other. That is unlinked. We don't write them like that if they are linked. There's special notation. So what does this actually tell us? Well, this individual got um, a dominant allele from one parent and a recessive allele from another, a dominant allele from one parent, a recessive allele from another. And so I would write them like this, the dominant allele from one parent, the recessive allele from another, and the dominant allele from one parent, the recessive allele from another, and I use two lines to separate them, just like that. Okay, so let me clean that up just a little bit. So this is the way that you would write them. You don't have to draw this next part. I just wanna help contextualize this a little bit. So the way that I think about this is that these are two genes that are located on one chromosome that comes from one parent, and these are two genes located on the homologous chromosome that comes from the other parent. So this tells me that the gene for whatever R is is linked to the gene for whatever G is. They are found on the same chromosome. So this is how you would write notation for linked genes, and it is very important that you write them properly. So we talked a bit about recombination. A recombinant, that's a thing, that is a new combination of alleles um, on a chromosome that is the result of crossing over. So hopefully this diagram looks a bit um, familiar to you. This shows crossing over in prophase one of meiosis. So let's draw out what this might look like and then we'll write it in notation. So before crossing over, my homologous pairs might look like this, right? That one parent has the dominant allele for both traits and the other parent has the recessive allele. After crossing over, it might look like this, where there's been an exchange of alleles. And then once these homologous pairs separate in meiosis one and the sister chromatids separate in meiosis two, I've got different combinations in each of my gametes. So dominant and dominant, dominant and recessive, recessive and dominant, and recessive and recessive. These two are my recombinants. Okay, so now that we've seen that visually, we can go ahead and write this out as well. Okay, well, why don't I just do this? Here we go. So let's write this out in linked gene notation and we will identify the recombinants. So we've written this before, okay? If I have an individual that is heterozygous for each trait, then I would write it out like this. 
okay? When this individual is forming gametes, okay, these um, are going to segregate, right? So we're only gonna have one allele of each um, for each trait. So um, these two could stay together and this gamete could inherit big R and big G or this um, chromosome could all stay together and a, a gamete could inherit little r, little g. Or there could be crossing over. So if there is crossing over between here and here, then my recombinants look like this. Then I would have a big R and a little g, so this one and this one, and a big G and a little r. And these are my recombinants. So it's very important to be able to recognize recombinant genotypes when we see them. So let's back up for a second. If two genes are unlinked, then all of the gamete possibilities are equally likely and they will fit the Mendelian ratio. So if you watch the video on dihybrid crosses, you've already seen this example, but seed shape um, can either be round or wrinkled, wrinkled is recessive, or color could be green or yellow, yellow is recessive. And if I have two plants that are both heterozygous, that would look like this. Because they are unlinked, I am writing it in just this unlinked notation. When I'm coming up with the gametes for my dihybrid cross, all possibilities are equally likely. So I use this notation, or this is how I do it anyways, um, to figure out the possible gametes here. And I would do that for both of my parents. Then you can go ahead and fill in your dihybrid cross. Again, if they are unlinked, you're just going to write them as normal. And when I finish that, I'm going to get a nine to three to three to one ratio. Again, you won't get that ratio for every dihybrid cross. That's only if you are mating together two plants that are heterozygous for each trait. Okay, but all of these gametes are equally likely because they do not rely on crossing over. They are unlinked and those genes are found on uh, different chromosomes. So again, all are equally likely. If the genes, however, are linked, we can still do a Punnett square, and we will in just a second. But what this Punnett square predicts and what we will actually get are going to be different. We are going to get a non-Mendelian ratio because some of those recombinants are going to be less likely due to the fact that they rely on crossing over between them on the chromosome. Let's do an example. So in a certain plant, white is dominant over red. So I'll choose big W and little w. And tall is dominant over dwarf. So I'll use big T and little t. A pure breeding white tall parent is crossed with a pure breeding red dwarf parent. Okay, so let's assume here that these are linked, okay? It doesn't tell us that in the problem, but I'm gonna write it in, that these are linked genes. And so if I were to have a pure breeding, that means homozygous, white parent, that would be this, white and white, and tall and tall, that is one parent, and I'm gonna cross that with a pure breeding red, so that means recessive and dwarf. And that means that all of my offspring, so even if there's crossing over here, there's not a lot of choices. Um, all of my offspring in my F1 generation are going to have this genotype. Okay. So this is going to be um, the genotype of all of the F1 plants. So I can use this to then get my Punnett square started. In some cases, there no crossing over will occur between these genes, and the genotype for the uh, gametes will look like this. Okay, again, no crossing over could occur, and the genotype would look like this. Okay, if crossing over did occur, then I would get a recombinant, and my recombinant would be either this or this. Okay, so I'm actually going to rewrite those. Actually, no, I'm going to just put a little star by them that these are my recombinants, these two right here. 
All right, I'm then going to do the same along the side of my Punnett square here because I'm just taking another F1 plant and I'm crossing it. So my genotypes would look the same. These two do not depend on crossing over. These last two genotypes are my recombinants. They do depend on crossing over. Now, when you fill in your dihybrid cross with your linked genes, you have to write them in linked notation. So I would take the genotype from one parent and I'm gonna write it on top with two lines in the middle and then the genotype from my other parent. Let's try that in the next box. The genotype from one parent and then the genotype from the other parental gamete, just like this. So you can go ahead and fill in your Punnett square. And now that I've done that, I just wanna go through and count the different phenotypes just like we do with regular dihybrid crosses. So what are my options? Well, these could be white and tall, they could be white and dwarf, they could be red and tall, or they could be red and dwarf. So what I do is I just go through and I try to figure out what each one is like and I make a tally mark. So for example, this plant um, up in the upper left-hand corner is white white and tall, so I'm gonna color code it like that, and I'm going to make a tally mark. All right, so go ahead and do that for all of yours, and then pause this video, it might take you a minute, and then we can check our answers. So I'm getting, or I'm getting a predicted nine to three to three to one ratio of these different phenotypes. That is what my Punnett square is predicting. Now, in reality, Everything in this whole section here might not actually turn out the way that we predicted because they all rely on having recombinant genotypes, okay? So all of these represent at least one recombinant and these down here both, uh, it's just a mess. Okay, so what this is telling me is I might not actually get this nine to three to three to one ratio. If no crossing over occurs between these genes, then these will not turn out in this way. Now let's say I actually do this cross and this is the actual data I get for each one of those genotypes or phenotypes rather. We can use something called the chi-squared test to determine if what we got, if what we observed is significantly different than what we expected. And much like the student's t-test, we're going to be writing both a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis for this. The null hypothesis says that there is no significant difference in what we observed versus what we expected, and that means that this trait does fit the predicted ratio. The alternative hypothesis is that there is a significant difference between what we observed and what we expected, and this trait does not follow the predicted ratio. So my first step here is actually to figure out the total number of plants in my sample. So if I add all these up together, I should get 165. The expected ratio comes from my dihybrid cross. So I expected nine out of 16 of them to be white and tall, three out of 16 to be white and dwarf, three out of 16 to be red and tall, and one out of 16 to be red and dwarf. So I've gone ahead and changed these ratios into percents just because it makes my math a little bit easier. Because in this next step, I need to figure out what were my expected numbers. So I knew what my expected ratio is. Well, if I had 165 total plants and I know what percentage of them should be white and tall, I just need to figure out what 56.25% of 165 is. And that is my expected number. So I I should have been expecting 92.8125 white and tall plants, 30.9375 white dwarf plants, the same number of uh, red and tall plants, and 10.3125 of the red dwarf plants. It's okay that they're decimals. We know that there can no, not be a decimal of a plant. This is just a mathematical tool, so hang with me here. You should be getting the same total as you had for your um, sample size. Okay, so now I know these expected numbers. 
Now we can actually work on calculating chi-squared. And to calculate chi-squared, you're going to take the observed value, that's what O is, minus the expected value, and you are going to square that, and then divide that by the expected value. So to find this uh, value here, I would take observed minus expected and square that, and divide it by the expected value. And so when I do that for all four of my categories, here's what I'm getting. And what I wanna find is the total. Now I've rounded a little bit, so it's okay if you're a tiny bit off from mine. But when I add all these together, I'm getting a value of 116. This is actually the only thing I care about in this entire table. This is the value known as chi-squared. And now I need to compare that calculated value, so my calculated chi-squared was 116, with a critical value in the table. Now, for biology, we use the p-value of 0.05, so those are listed across the top, so I want to look for something in this column, and that's the, the cutoff value for confidence for biology. I need to cross-reference that with what we call the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom is going to be the number of categories minus one. Well, I had white and tall, white and dwarf, red and tall, red and dwarf. So in this case, I had four categories minus one, which means my degrees of freedom here should be three. So I want to find that three degrees of freedom in my table, and that's right here. And so I wanna look and see where those intersect. And so it looks like my critical value for my chi-square in this instance is 7.81. So 7.81 is the critical value. Woo. Okay, so what are we gonna do with this once we have this? Well, here's the rule. If the calculated chi-squared is greater than the critical value in the table, we are going to reject the null hypothesis. So that means we will accept the alternative hypothesis, and this means that there is a significant difference between what we observed and what we expected, and the conclusion that we can make is that this trait does not follow the predicted ratio, and that's exactly in line with our understanding of linked genes and the decreased frequency of the recombinant. Confidence. That dihybrid cross is assuming independent assortment and that does not happen with linked genes. So great application here of that chi-squared test.